Today we are in part five of our series called I Am Because He Is. And we're talking about this issue of identity. We can um, know who we are. We know better who we are as we learn more about who he is, who Jesus is, who God is. As we push into who he is, it actually shows us who we are. So we're talking about identity. And um, as this passage we're looking at today It shows one piece of our identity, because if you're thinking about your identity, there are so many pieces that make up who you are, and there's this one part of our identity, one piece of our lives that really shapes and affects our identity. It's where we call home. Wherever you call home, that's part of what shapes who you are. I discovered this when I went off to college. I grew up down here in uh, South Florida, born and raised in South Florida. My my wife, Rebecca, and I love this region, want to give our lives to this region. And so I lived down here except for when I was off at school. And when I went to college, I went uh, up to um, the Midwest, northern Indiana, and to, to college, and so um, everything was fine. The fall was beautiful, and then I discovered something called winter. In northern Indiana, it's no joke, okay? I mean, the winter, it's, um, it's crazy, okay? It's so cold. I wasn't fully prepared for that. And so I, I had a great experience up there and met a lot of wonderful people and, and had a great time. But I learned there were so many things about being from South Florida. Since my home is down here, there were so many things I didn't anticipate that were a little bit different up there. And there's a lot of things, but there's one thing I will always remember— um, in our, uh, on our campus, there was a place called the Dining Commons, and that's where we would go to get our meals. And uh, in the Dining Commons, they had um, something um, that had just arrived from heaven, a soft serve ice cream machine, okay? And there's a thing about soft serve ice cream, because it's not, like if you've ever operated the machine yourself, like there's something about soft serve, it's not just delicious, but it's like a challenge, right? Okay? Because you're trying to like swirl it and see like how high you can get. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like, it's like a challenge. It's, a, it's an event every time. Okay. And so um, I, I would go and my pattern was I'd eat my meal. I'd go get the soft serve ice cream and then I would take it like to go. As I'm leaving, I would eat ice cream as I went. And so for me being from South Florida, like there is never a bad time to eat ice cream. Can I get an Amen. Okay, all right, just making sure you're with me. All right, there's never a bad time to eat ice cream. I mean, if you're celebrating, celebrate with ice cream, okay? If you have a good day, have some ice cream. You have a bad day, definitely have some ice cream, okay? Never a bad time to have ice cream. But what I learned about in the Midwest is in their minds, or and also farther north, in their minds, ice cream is like seasonal, So like they think of when they, like in the summer, that's when they think about having ice cream because it's warm outside and they think about having ice cream. That's heresy, okay? (laughs) Ice cream is good at all times. So anyway, so this is what what happened to me. So I would eat, that would be my my pattern. I'd eat my, my dinner or my lunch. I'd get ice cream as I'm leaving. And it was like all year round. So like in the middle of January, it's like 20 degrees outside. Wind chill is like bringing it down into the single digits. I go to the soft serve ice cream, get my big swirl, ask my buddy to hold it, and then I put on my sweater, and then my jacket, and then my mittens, and then my hat, and then my scarf. Okay, like I get all bundled up. Then I get my ice cream, and I walk outside. And my friends are like, bro, what are you doing? I'm like, I... I'm eating ice cream. Like, what's, why aren't you eating ice cream? They're like, because it's winter, okay? And what happened next was one of the most unbelievable phenomenons of nature. I have never eaten ice cream in the middle of winter. Like, you're eating it outside, and it doesn't melt. <laughs> like, I'm like, this is defying physics, okay? It, like, it's just there. Like, you've never had, like, I was, it changed the way I eat it, because usually I'm eating it to try and keep it from melting. You know what I'm talking about? It's like not melting. It was amazing. In fact, as I was walking out, I, I saw one day in the middle of winter, some other idiot was drinking, eating ice cream in, in winter, and he'd had that tragedy happen where he licks the ice cream and it falls off, you know? You know that trial that you've walked through before in your life? And I remember I walked out one day and I see that there's the ice cream was sitting there on the step, but because it was the middle of winter, 
it was still in its perfect form <laughs> laying on the ground. No one bothered to pick it up. And so for weeks, it's staying in the same form, just getting dirty, okay? I don't know why, never melted. So if you ever have an opportunity to eat ice cream in the middle of winter, go for it. It's an amazing experience, okay? But here's what I learned. I, I learned that here, I, you know, being from South Florida, this is my home, going somewhere else, it shapes so much of me, even my ice cream eating habits. Like there's so many little details because this is my home. Like it's shaped who I am. It shapes so many pieces of my identity. It, 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 it shapes so many little aspects of who I am. That's the way identity works. There's so many pieces that make up your identity, and your concept of home is a big piece of that. And this passage in 1 Peter picks up that idea of, of home and how that shapes our identity, our identity. So open to 1 Peter chapter 1. We've been working through this in this series, and we're at verse 13. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Look what he says. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, in just a moment, I want to keep reading a few more verses, but we're going to hang in this verse for a little bit because there's so much in here. He starts by saying, therefore, and whenever that's happening is obviously he's, whatever he's about to say is built on what he just said. So we're kind of entering right in the middle and he's saying, in light of that, I want you to do this. So what did he just say? What he just talked about, if you joined us the last uh, couple weeks, you know that he just exposed a key part of our identity if we're a Christ follower, if we're a Christian. There's a key part of our identity. He says that we are heirs which may not be something you've ever thought about yourself. You've never thought about yourself as an heir, but he says we have an inheritance. We are one day, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are one day going to be in heaven by the, because of the work of Jesus. You'll be in heaven. It's like you're inheriting heaven, and he calls us heirs. So he says, therefore, in light of the fact that heaven is coming, then he goes on with this section that we're reading. And the main command in this verse is this phrase. He says, set your hope on. That's the main command. The command to us is to set your hope on. And he's going to say the revelation of Jesus. And we'll come back to that in a second. But what does he mean by setting your hope on? Like, how do we know what we're setting our hope on? It seems kind of just one of those, like, how do I know how to set my hope on something or, or what I'm setting my hope on? I know what I'm setting my hope on by how I finish this sentence. It's going to be okay because whatever I say next, however I fill in that blank, that's what I'm setting my hope on. So like in our lives, it's going to be okay because I have a stable job. It's going to be okay because I work for a good company. It's going to be okay because I've put money away in savings or, or I've saved up a retirement. It's going to be okay because I'm really gifted at what I do, so I'll always be, be able to find work. It's going to be okay because at least I have my education. It's going to be okay because, and then fill in the blank. However we fill in the blank, that's what we're setting our hope in. So this passage is commanding us telling us, um, it's saying, this is what you should set your hope in. Set your hope in Jesus. More specifically, the revelation of Jesus, the revealing of Jesus. Set your hope in that moment. Okay, now what is the revelation of Jesus? What is he talking about there? You know, there's all kinds of different views about Jesus. You, you might be here or joining us online or sitting in the pilot campus. You might be joining us and you might say, look, honestly, I don't, think about Jesus a whole lot. But, you know, if you were to ask me, I'd say Jesus is like, he's like the ultimate, like, nice guy. I mean, everyone, I mean, Jesus is, everyone knows Jesus was nice. Like, he's kind, he's a good guy, compassionate. So maybe that's what your view of Jesus is. 
Others of you, you might be here, you might be watching online, and you might say, look, if I had to classify myself, you might say, I'm an atheist. You say, look, I'm not, I, I just, I don't believe. I, I just don't really believe in God. I believe Jesus was a historical person, but I'm just not sure that I believe, you know, that he was anything beyond that. And, and, and if you're here, and that's your perspective, let me just say, man, I, I so respect that you're here. Because that takes so much integrity to have an open mind and be willing to hear another perspective. So if that's you, if you're watching or you're here and you'd say, I'm an atheist, I, I just respect that you're here. That might be your perspective. Someone else might say, look, I would classify myself as an agnostic. I don't know what I believe about Jesus. In fact, you might say, I don't even know if you can know anything for sure about God or about Jesus. Others of you, you might be here and you might say, yeah, I would call myself a Christian because I believe that Jesus Christ is the greatest model for how to live. Like if everyone could just live the way Jesus did, then, you know, that, then everything would be so much better. And so you say, I'm, I'm a Christian because I think Jesus is a good model. And if that's your perspective, let me just gently push back on that and say, if that's your view of Jesus, that he's a good model for living, that's not Christianity. Because what the Bible says about Jesus is crazy. It says things like this. Everything is held together by Jesus. That's just insane. It says in Revelation, it says Jesus is the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. Everything begins and ends with Jesus. It says this in Acts. It says Jesus is the author of life. He authored life. Like, how could that be? It says in John, it says that everything was created through Jesus, that nothing that exists was made except that which was made through Jesus. Everything's made by Jesus. Colossians, it says it's all made by him for him. In fact, the Bible says in Romans, it says that the work Jesus started when he was here, when he died on the cross and rose again, the work that he started, he is continuing to work, and one day he's going to return, and he's going to finish all of it, like it's all going to be consummated, it's all going to be done and completed. And here's what it says in Romans. Everything in the universe is groaning and waiting for him to finish his work. Do you realize what the Bible is saying about Jesus? It's like he's the centerpiece of everything. Like how could that be? Because what the Bible is absolutely 100% clear on is that Jesus, yes, he was fully a man, but here's what's happening with Jesus. Here's all of the, all of the universe, all of creation, the one who made all of it, is entering into his creation in the form of a man. The creator entering in. Jesus is God in the flesh. And he didn't show up to be like, man, what are you guys doing? You guys are all rebelling against what I told you to do. I mean, I'm God. You should be doing what I tell you to do, but you're all in rebellion. What's wrong with you? That's not what he came to do. The creator came into his creation in order to die on a cross to pay the penalty for all of our rebellion. And he rose again on the third day, demonstrating that he was indeed the author of life. He was God in the flesh. And what's offered to anyone, it's offered to you here today, is if you simply put your faith in Jesus, all your sins are washed away, and you'll spend eternity in heaven. Salvation is offered as a free gift. But, he, but don't miss this. What this is saying is there's a day when Jesus will be revealed, when he will return. And the Bible says it could be at any minute. In other words, what that means is this, off, this opportunity to put your faith in Jesus is an opportunity that one day that window closes. There will not always be that opportunity. And honestly, we don't know when that moment is. Jesus could come back at any moment. But what it says is when Jesus will return, even though there's a bunch of different perspectives on who Jesus is right now, the moment Jesus returns, there will be no more confusion, there will be no more mystery, there will no longer be a multitude of opinions. It says when Jesus returns, every knee will bow and tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so in this window of opportunity, 
There are some that say, no, I wouldn't just call myself a Christian. I've put my faith in Jesus. I've sunk my hope in Jesus. In other words, I am a Christ follower. I'm a disciple, or we use the ancient Greek word in the Bible, mathetes. I am a follower of Jesus. In other words, I have given Jesus my life. He has the remote controls of my life. He's not only my Savior, he's my Lord. I, I follow after him. I'm all in on Jesus. That's what it means to follow Jesus. He says, set your hope. It's going to be all right because Jesus is going to return. And my hope is in him. You say, okay, how do I, how do, I do that? What, do we, what does it mean to, to do that? And he gives these two metaphors in here. We just read them. He says two things about our minds. He says, um, getting our minds ready for action and being sober-minded. Now, these are two really interesting metaphors. That first one, getting our minds ready for action, is actually the Greek phrase, gird the loins of your mind. You can see why we're grateful that they translated it a little differently in English, Okay. And here's what that means. To understand that phrase, you'll see that all through the Bible, you have to understand the clothes of the ancients, okay? They, they're not walking around in jeans, okay? They're wearing robes. And so they're wearing a robe all the way down to their ankles. So you can imagine that's fine most of the time, but if you're going to do any kind of physical activity, that's going to be really restraining and confining, so if they had some kind of physical activity, they would gird their robes, and it would be literally, they would bunch up their robe, they would pull it forward, they'd probably tuck it through their legs and around, and then tie it. So it's kind of all wrapped around their legs, leaving their legs free so that they can do hard work. So like, why would you uh, gird up your robe like that if you're going out to work in the field, do hard manual labor, you would need the flexibility, so you'd gird up your robe. You would also do that if you were about to fight. So like if you're going to go into battle, go on the battlefield, that's one of the phrases, uh, gird your loins. As you're getting ready to go, you're, you're tying up your robe, getting ready for battle. There is a metaphor in our culture that is absolutely identical. Roll up your sleeves. You're at work. I mean, it's what we talk about for hard work. So you're at work. It's going to be like a late night budget meeting, and someone says, all right, guys, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. And they're not meaning like literally like we can't work on this budget without our sleeves rolled up. It's too exhausting, okay? It's a phrase. But also like if someone's like going to fight, you're like, all right, hey, let's take this outside, buddy, okay? And they might be rolling up their sleeves. It's the exact same metaphor, just different article of clothing. So here's what Peter's saying. Roll up the sleeves of your mind, He's saying, Christian, you have to be mentally ready to work. Like you have to have, you have to be ready for the hard mental work. You can't, we can't be lazy mentally. We have to be ready to work, maybe even to battle in our minds. Roll up the sleeves of your mind. Then he says, be sober-minded. It's the second metaphor. Now, the Bible talks a lot about um, intoxication and the dangers and the damage that drunkenness causes. And getting drunk is a sin in the Bible is what it talks about very clearly. Here, the Bible is not talking about literal drunkenness. It's using it as a metaphor. He's saying, keep your minds sober. Don't let your minds get intoxicated by whatever's around it. Okay. So far, he said, in light of the fact that heaven is coming, set your hope in Jesus and his return. And to do that, you have to have a mind ready to work, and you have to have a mind that's sober thinking, clear thinking. Okay, let me just briefly read through this passage. Look what it says next, 14 through 17. Verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it was written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, watch this, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your, what's that word right there? Exile. He's saying something interesting about you and me. You're in exile. What's someone who lives in exile? 
Someone who's in exile is someone for whatever reason is living in a foreign land. They cannot live in their homeland. They might be forced out. They might not be able to get back. They might not be allowed to come back. One way or another, they're in exile. They're living in a foreign land, but not living in their home. Peter is calling you, Christian, an exile. In fact, this is one of his favorite ways to describe you. If you remember the first week of our series, 1 Peter 1.1, do you remember what it said? Look at what he says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, this is the beginning of his whole letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles. Later in chapter 2, this is what he says. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. Here's what he's saying about you. If you are a follower of Christ, this is not your home. You are just passing through here. You're a visitor here. Your true home is somewhere else. Where is it? Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, this is not your home. You are an exile. There are going to be things that happen here that are a little foreign to you because this is no longer your home. And he says in in these last verses, he says, so don't conform to your former ignorance. Don't keep living like you were living before you learned about Jesus. Don't conform to that. Or or one more verse. Here's what it says in Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Here's what he's saying. He's saying in order for us to, to operate like we are exiles, like our home is somewhere else, he says, don't be conformed to the world around you. Now, conformity and nonconformity are tricky. There's a Princeton study where they did a test on their own students. And this is uh, back when the, uh, the iPod had just come out. Can you remember like way back when there was something called an iPod, okay? And it was like you, you um, like if you were like the first one, you had this little rectangle of, of all your friends that had an iPod. You're like, yeah, all my music, it's inside of there. And your friend's are like, where do you put the CD in there? I can't, it's not big enough, okay? And it was just this amazing feat of technology, okay? And it was this huge thing. Everyone wanted an, an iPod. And so they did, it was in that era, and they did a test, a study on students, and they picked all, only students who had an iPod. And they asked them about it, and one of their key questions was, um, were you influenced by other people to buy an iPod? And ac- almost across the board, they all said, no, I didn't, wasn't influenced by anyone else. Like, I, I got it because I wanted it. And then they asked the follow-up question, what about most of your friends? do you think they were influenced by other people to get their iPod? And almost across the board, they say, oh yeah, those people were influenced by other people. I was not influenced, but they were. And the point of the story, or the point of the study, was that we have a tendency to think of ourselves as nonconformist. In other words, we stand in a room full of people with iPods thinking we are the only one that got it because of ourselves. No, I'm not conforming. These other people are conforming. I am the true nonconformist. We all think of ourselves as a nonconformist. No, I'm just doing what I want to do or what I think is right. But man, conformity is so much more tricky than we realize. Uh, let me I- illustrate this another way. I-, I want you to go ahead and pull up a- that picture up on the screen. I want you to look at uh, this picture, okay? There is a certain segment of the population years ago that drove this type of vehicle. Who was it? Hippies. Hippies, they, they drove Volkswagen vans all painted up with flowers. Now here's the interesting thing about the hippie movement. It was by definition a non-conformist movement. So why did they all drive the same vehicle? Okay, this is the tricky thing of nonconformity. 
even the hippies back in the day, I mean, they had kind of a wardrobe that they all wore. Their, their pants, like, you know, were bell-bottom at the bottom, and they had their hair all long and wild, you know, and they you know, had peace signs and flowers and stuff. They listened to the same music. Here's how conformity and nonconformity works. There's one person that says, I'm a nonconformist. How about you all come conform to my nonconformity? And then the people conform, saying, I'm a nonconformist, just like all these people around me. See, nonconformity is so tricky. Because we want to think we're nonconformists, but we don't realize how actually we are very, how, how easy it is to conform to what's around us. So here's how this works there's conformity, which is being swayed by the culture around me. I am, the culture sways me, I just do what culture does. There's anti conformity, which is different. I am repelled by culture. So whatever culture does, I do the opposite. Which actually means both are being influenced by the culture, right? Nonconformity is something different. Nonconformity is having a completely different frame of reference. So I'm not trying to be different. I just have a different frame of reference than what culture is. So there may be some things that are similar, some things that are not similar. I, that's not what I'm concerned about. I have a different frame of reference, a different reference point. That's what this is calling you to, Christian. Don't conform. Don't be anti-conformist. Don't try to be different and weird. It says, but you have a different frame of reference. You have a different reference point. This is not your home. Heaven is your home. Conform to God. He said, I am holy. I'm set apart. Be like me. Our frame of reference is God. So there are going to be some things in culture that we embrace, and there's going to be some things in culture that we're going to look like aliens and strangers and do something completely different. How do you know the difference? You got to roll up the sleeves of your mind. You got to be sober minded, not just intoxicated by the culture. See, here, this passage is saying something about our identity. I am an exile. That is who I am. This is telling me a piece of my identity. I, I am, my identity is made up by where my home is. This is not my home. Heaven is my home. That will shape details of my life. There's going to be some things that are natural to this culture that since this is not my home, they're going to be alien to me. They're going to be different. It's going to sh my, my home being in heaven is going to shape parts of my life. I am an, an exile. The reason I'm an exile is because of something about Jesus. Because he is returning. Because Jesus is coming again and taking us to heaven, those of us who've put our faith in Jesus who are Christ followers, because he is one day returning, and I'm waiting for that moment any minute, that is part of what shapes me to realize this is not my home, and any minute I will be facing eternity. Whether I get hit by a bus on my way home today, or Jesus returns, either of which could happen at any minute, I am facing my eternity at any second, which reminds me that this is not my home. I am an exile, a sojourner, a visitor, traveling through. So you know what this is forcing us to think? This is forcing us to get this part of our identity deep into our hearts and minds. And maybe you do what we've been doing through this series. You get a dry erase marker and you write this on your mirror at home. I am an exile because he is returning. And you just look through it every morning to remind yourself this is not your home. So what is that? What are the implications then for you? What changes this week because of that reality? What if we actually lived like heaven was real? What if we were so convinced 
of the reality that one day I'll close my eyes for the last time and will be immediately in eternity in heaven? Like, what if I set my hope in that? It's going to be okay because of that. And what if I let that reverberate through my, mind, through my, my life and, and my mind? And so then I made that my frame of reference. And what if we were ready knowing that our lives are going to look different than the patterns of this world? Students, teens, you're about ready to go back to school. Here's what this means, students. There are going to be ways that your lives look different from the other students in your class. Your lives are going to look different. Expect it. Expect that you carry yourself different. You treat people different. You date differently. What you do for entertainment is different. Expect that there will be some things that are completely strange to your classmates. Be ready, because that's a reality. This isn't your home. If you're a follower of Christ, heaven is. Parents, <laughs> parents, we've got to roll up the sleeves of our minds and not just be intoxicated by how all of the other parents lead their kids. We're going to make decisions, some decisions that are different. Not to just try to be different. We're going to think what pieces of our family life are going to be different. We're going to parent differently. We're going to handle our finances different. The way we handle our finances, each of us is going to be different than the other people in the economic bracket that, are, that we're in. The people that are in the same economy that you are, they're going to handle their money different. Why? Because you're a stranger here. Your real, your, your real address is in heaven. Your, your real home is in heaven. So you're not going to spend your money the same way. You're not going to budget the same way. You're going to be living a life of generosity, storing up treasures in heaven. That's your home. Business owners, you're going to, you're going to run your businesses different. Leaders, you're going to treat people different. You're going, to have, you're going to have a different type of impact in, in whatever industry that you're in. You're going to, there's going to be ways that you are operating differently. Let's get that expectation in our hearts and our minds so that we can engage our minds and think how, in, in reference to the fact that my eternity is in heaven, in reference to the fact that, that I am not just swayed by what the industry is doing, what the culture is doing, what the people around me are doing, what the friend group is doing around me, I am going to reference who God is. That's determining how I live. We're not swayed by the culture. We're not running away from the culture. We're entering into the culture and redeeming it. Christian, here in our city, you should be the best version of our culture. The most redeemed, beautiful, godly version of our culture. Expressing that. So can you dare to ask yourself a dangerous question or ask God a dangerous question? God, how have I conformed a part of my life to the world rather than to you? Can you push your mind into that and ask that? Whether you've been walking with Jesus for a few weeks or a few decades, can you push into that and ask him that? Let's take some time together and, and come before him and ask him that dangerous question together. Can we just have a quiet moment in prayer? Would you bow your heads for a second? Maybe you're watching online. Maybe you are over on our pilot campus. Christian, can you just sit before him and surrender and just... Ask him a dangerous question. How have I conformed? Ask him in just the quietness of this moment, ask him to reveal to you this week how you can conform more to him than to the culture around you. You can live like heaven is actually a reality. Because it is. Jesus said, if it wasn't so, I wouldn't tell you. 
In other words, this is Jesus saying, you think I'm lying? Heaven is a reality and it's your home. What if we let the Holy Spirit show us what it would look like to live with that reality? And if that's a reality, that means some of you need to make a decision today. Because there's some of you, maybe you fit one of those categories I talked about before, an atheist or agnostic, or maybe you just think that Jesus is a a, a good example of how to live. You have a window of opportunity to put your hope in Jesus. To believe that he was more than just a historical person, more than just a good teacher, more than just a good model. Jesus did something on the cross that pays for your sins and that's being offered to you for free as a gift. Would you accept that gift today? Put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you're sensing that today is that moment of, for you to put your faith in Jesus. And so here's what I want you to do. With every, everyone just has their eyes closed for a second. Everyone has their heads bowed. But you say, that's me. I, I want to take that step today. I want to know for sure I'm saved. I want to know that I'm going, into, going to heaven. I want to know that I'm permanently forgiven. I want to put my faith in Jesus for the first time. There's no one looking around. Everyone's heads are bowed. If that's you, what I want you to do is just slip your hand in the air because I want to lead you in a prayer. You say, I want to take that step. Put my faith in Jesus. I see it. Who else? I see it. Amen. Anyone else who say, look, that's me. I need to take that step today. Amen. If that's you, I want to lead you in this simple prayer right there in your seats. Just silently repeat these words after me in your heart. Make this your prayer to God. Just say, God, I believe believe Jesus died on the cross and it paid for my sins. I believe Jesus rose again from the dead. And I surrender my life to you. I want to follow you, starting now. In Jesus' name.